I spoke with you earlier today on ABC Conversation. Some of you might have heard that. And I referred to him there as a wise elder, which he was a bit resistant to, but I think it is an, an no, to accurate totally title. Resistant to. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to use it again. Hugh is a wise elder. Um, because of those decades that he spent as a pioneering social researcher and as someone who's reflected very deeply on our collective psyche and guiding, being guided by the question of what is it that, that gives our lives meaning and satisfaction? And I think the answer that he's arrived at can best be summed up in one word, kindness. And his new book is called The Kindness Revolution. So please join me again in just welcoming Hugh McKay this evening. You, you. Hugh, we are of course speaking as this era of COVID is far from over. And as time goes on, I wonder how you think we'll look back at this in 20 or 30 years, how might we remember what now feels such a difficult and challenging time. Mm. I hope we'll look back on it and say that was the making of us. Uh, what I hope is that the jolt, the disruption, the threat uh, from COVID-19 in Australia has been enough to shake us out of a kind of torpor that we'd sunk into as a result of the last I suppose 25 or 30 years of Australia in which we'd, we'd been, our society had been reshaped by a number of social trends, uh, all of which were promoting the idea of individualism. I mean, if you look at things like our shrinking households, our rate of relationship breakdown, uh, our excessive busyness, uh, even changing the way we greet each other. Had you noticed pre-COVID, we, we, we got into the habit of saying, how are you going, busy? As though, come on, you know, are you, are you busy or are you dead? The switch is, is on or off. Uh, this is how you should be. To say nothing of our embrace of information technology, um, all of the, and, and many other social changes that we're not here to discuss tonight, but, but that period uh, underpinned, as it were, by 28 years of continuous economic growth had really, uh, the social changes had had the effect of making us a much more fragmented society than we had previously been. A society in which we became um, much more concerned about ourselves as individuals, as independent, caught up in what uh, sociologists and social psychologists had come to describe as the me culture, uh, very self-absorbed. Uh, and, and that was kind of reinforced by the steady economic growth. So that was saying to us, it's okay to go on like this. Look how well we're doing. You know, what is there to worry about? Look after number one. That's, uh, that's uh, a much a rampant individualism reaching its full flowering in the last few years with our obsession with personal identity, uh, which I think is and nothing wrong with being clear about our identity, of course, but identity politics, the obsession, I think it is now an obsession with gender identity, ethnic identity, cultural identity, to an extent that promotes the idea that what's important about me is how I'm different from you. What's important about me is my uniqueness and my independence. Now, for members of a social species, which is what we are, like many other species on the planet, we are actually hopeless in isolation. We need each other. We need groups, communities, families, neighbourhoods, colleagues, meetings, all sorts of human social settings to nurture us, sustain us, and to give us that all-important sense of belonging that's fundamental to our mental and emotional health. So the process that I've been describing of 25 or 30 years of changes pushing us away from that awareness and favoring the idea of independence, uniqueness, separateness, and so on, was not sustainable. So my hope is that COVID-19, following the bushfires, worst in living memory, um, uh, I mean, it's a bit funny to say my hope. I mean, COVID has been a terrible experience for a lot of people. 
But my hope is it's been a bad enough experience, a disruptive enough experience for all of us to teach us some very, uh, not teach us, remind us of some very important things we know about what it means to belong to a social species and to internalise those, those repeat lessons, those reminders, and to stay with them, as people sometimes do when the shocks in their lives, personally or societally, are bad enough. So really the question, in a way, is has this been a sufficient disruption to short-circuit the process I've been describing and take us back to the deeper truth about ourselves, which is not how different we are, but how we share a common humanity and we can make most sense of our existence on the planet, our existence in this city, in this community, if we recognise that we share a common humanity, that we, we exist in this web of interconnectedness. And when we ignore that in favour of uh, individuality, we're in trouble. What are some of the, the stories of kindness from this last year that have most resonated with you or stick out for you as, as the kind of reorientation that you hope will continue post-pandemic? Mm. Well, they're legion, I must say. I mean, the, the first thing to be said, I think, is looking at Australia as a, a vast social laboratory. Uh, the good news about COVID-19 is that we did what we were told. We accepted that instructions about staying home, wearing masks, keeping our distance, etc., uh, were accepted as valuable guidance to express what we were obviously feeling, which was we'd better care for each other, not just look out for ourselves, but look out for each other. So all of that framework gave us guidance about how to do that. But of course, we went way beyond that. Uh, all over Australia, there's lovely stories of how, particularly in our big cities where neighbourliness had kind of waned. I hope not to the same extent in Brisbane as in Sydney and Melbourne. But or certainly Canberra, your hometown, to some which is a, is a renowned, dangerous place to live, Canberra. Yes, yes, yes. What, what kind of things happened in yeah. your own neighbourhood, in oh, your well, building? Well, uh, I mean, I, I was... In my, my own personal experience, the apartment block where I lived, a wonderful young couple um, called us up and said, anything we can do? You know, do you need us to do your shopping? As if we were frail elderly. <laughs> uh, we said, thanks very much. We've got it sorted. Uh, um, another neighbour organised a balcony choir. Uh, we Did all you got out on it. Of course, in that? yes. Because uh, one of the things I missed most during the lockdown was the regular rehearsals of the choir I belong to. So we're out on our balcony. What were you singing? Um, very forgettable material. <laughs> uh, I was wishing that it, it, was, it was not rollicking. He, he distributed all the words. Some of these songs I'd never heard of before. <laughs> and he was amplifying the sound on his balcony. But, I mean, I joined in, but, uh, but I... I it I, wasn't I can't bark. tell you. I see. No, it no, was more no, we didn't. <laughs> no, no, that's right. No, we didn't do St. John Passion, as I recall. Uh, we didn't even do The Road to Gundagai or something that I, that I would have remembered. So that happened. But then I heard all these other... I mean, one of the most vivid stories that I heard was actually from a friend in Melbourne who was a grandmother uh, who said that her daughter, the, the street where her daughter lives the daughter and the two-year-old granddaughter invited the grandmother, so there were three generations of females, uh, every Saturday during the first lockdown to go to the local farmer's market and buy a bag of oranges, which were then put into the toy pram of the two-year-old, and they walked up and down the street every Saturday with the two-year-old saying to each resident, would you like an orange? An orange. Uh, guess how many people refused? <laughs> <laughs> so they did that week after week. And, of course, they got to know the neighbours, including many that, that, that my friend's daughter and the granddaughter had never met before. But, but more generally, the account of what's happened since is a transformation in the life of that street. That act of, well, generosity, but, but connectedness meant that from then on, people were automatically waving and smiling and saying hello and shouting out greetings to each other. It became a community 
um, uh, the catalyst being the two-year-old with her pram full of oranges. The way that everyone immediately awed when you told that story, Hugh, what does that suggest to you about our innate sense for kindness mm. and, and responsiveness to hearing of kind acts or participating mm. in kindness? How mm. hardwired are we for that kind of interaction? Yeah, hardwired, I think, is the right term, Sarah. I don't think anyone ever uh, reflects, perhaps wakes up in the morning dreaming of how Australia could be different, uh, perhaps on a Sunday afternoon pondering uh, how our society could change. I don't think anyone ever says, I wish people wouldn't be so nice to me. You know, why can't we have more violence in this community? Why don't people just hit each other instead of wasting all these angry words? And not, not at all. I mean, if we dream of... There is, a, there is a universal dream. It's like an innate dream. We dream of a society that is less violent, that is kinder, more compassionate, more inclusive, more harmonious, more cooperative, less cynical. Uh, of course we do. And that's because we are hardwired as members of a social species, we are hardwired to cooperate. Um, neuroscientists who can now peep into our brains and see what's going on in ways that psychologists and philosophers could previously only speculate about, they say you can now identify the cooperative centre in the human brain. Not shocking or amazing. Of course there would be a cooperative centre in a species that's evolved uh, to be a social species. But that means effectively that we are hardwired hardwire for kindness because if we're a cooperative species, then what we need uh, is to generate harmonious communities that will sustain and nurture us and all those things I mentioned before. And the magic ingredient in doing that is, of course, our kindness and respect towards each other. So I think, in fact, I think the loveliest thing to be said about the species that we all belong to the, 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 the most, the most um, precious thing to be said about us is that we have this capacity for kindness. We don't always exercise it. It has to be nurtured. It has to be constantly reinforced and we have to practice, but it's there. The same as we have a language centre in the brain, which doesn't mean we are born speaking English or Polish or Russian or something. We have to learn it. That, 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 that capacity has to be developed in us, so does the capacity for kindness. But so when an audience responds to a story about a pram full of oranges and greeting the neighbours and so that's simply a recognition that that's what human nature is actually like. What, what Abraham Lincoln described as the better angels of our nature, that wonderfully poetic phrase, captures this, I think. We all know that when we are fully formed, flourishing, authentic human beings, the sign of that will be our disposition to be kind. It's such a powerful uh, um, characteristic, such a potent characteristic uh, of humans and such a valuable asset for humans that we are capable even of showing kindness towards people we don't like. Mm. Isn't that a remarkable thing to say? I mean, you know, if someone, if someone is in need of help, we don't cross-examine them to make sure that they're the sort of they're people like us, or that we could they, they'd qualify by being someone we could like, or could agree with about politics or religion. Not at all. They're in need. We help, uh, and they might be people whose views we abhor. Uh, they might be people who rub us up the wrong way. But it's, it's this beautiful human quality that enables us to be kind even to those people and even to total strangers. I think that's one of the most encouraging things about human nature. What about uh, other innate qualities or capacities that I think we notice at least in others, if not in ourselves, of competitiveness and selfishness. How does mm. this fit into this species mm. that you're describing that I'd really love to be a part of, but sometimes I feel I'm part of another ah. species which oh. has got oh, different yes. kind of emphasis? Oh, yeah. Let's, uh, I'm sounding a bit rose-tinted, aren't I? Let's, let's, let's tell the whole story. Um, by the way, just before I say that, I, d I don't think this, this capacity for kindness 
and the emphasis on it is rose tinted. We're not talking about something soft. We're talking about a quality that equips us to do the hard stuff better. It equips us to have a robust argument kindly. It equips us to discipline our children kindly, to terminate a relationship kindly, to complain about a neighbor's barking dog kindly. You, you, you don't become a pushover when you commit yourself, when you adopt kindness as your default position. But yes, of course, have the capacity for kindness doesn't mean we're always kind. There is no competitive center in the human brain, neuroscientists assure us. That is something we learn. And of course, we're fast learners. <laughs> and there are plenty of circumstances in which historically we've had to compete for territory or food or fresh water or sexual partners or in the modern world competing for a job or competing at an auction to buy a property and so on. Of course, there are circumstances in which we have to compete, though I do devote a little chunk of the book to the rules we ought to follow if we're going to compete cooperatively. And even some of the, some of the, I mean, the French Open is in progress at the moment. So you see those tennis players slugging it out uh, on, on, in, the, in the French Open or any other tennis tournament. That looks like naked competition. It's actually a supreme example of human cooperation. I mean, tennis is not going to work unless you agree you cooperate about, well, we'll, we'll, we'll recognise the significance of those lines and that net and we'll do what the umpire says usually. Um, uh, it's, it's an exercise. You have to cooperate before you can compete. Uh, comp the competition is kind of the last piece of the puzzle, but, but it's an exercise in cooperation. But yes, of course, in other circumstances, we do compete. We give way to anger. We are sometimes brutally unkind even to the people we love most. In fact, someone said to me recently, you're going on about uh, kindness to strangers being such a lovely thing. It's much easier to be kind <laughs> to strangers <laughs> than to some of the people I have to live with. Uh, well, there's, there's something in that sometimes. But of course, there are ego-driven impulses. Of course, there are times when we want to get our own way, even if it's at the expense of other people. There are times when we are consumed by ambition at all costs. There are times when the competitive urge simply overwhelms us and we forget to be kind. Now, what I'd say about all those circumstances, they are completely normal. We all do it. No one meets the gold standard all the time, but they all diminish us somewhat. When we give way to anger, when we give way to rampant individualism, competitiveness, ruthless ambition, we are less than fully human because we've retreated from that default position that should define us, which is our disposition to do all those things, even compete for a job, kindly. I want to ask you about listening because for many years of your career, you listened. You went to people's homes and sat there and, and managed to get them to, to share often very intimate things with you. Was it hard to get people to talk as a social researcher? No, it was sometimes hard to get them to stop. <laughs> and I'm sure you find this. I'm sure you often feel at the end of an hour, we, I wish we had another well, we've hour. Got, we've got the wonder that the news just cuts in at 12 o'clock. Yeah. It doesn't matter what people are saying, they've stopped. <laughs> yes, keep, keep talking by all means, but it won't be on the air, yes. Uh, how, no, well, how did you get people to, people, to speak? People love to be asked for their opinion. They love to be asked to tell their story. And quite often, I've mentioned this in the book, but quite often at the end of, a, of an interview, or sometimes I, I use the small group discussion um, method, completely different from the contemporary so-called focus group. I use groups of friends, neighbors, colleagues, people who know each other, meeting in their natural habitat, usually a private home, uh, talking uh, without any direction from me about whatever topic I wanted them to talk about. But quite often at the end of those interviews or group discussions, people would say, can we do this again next week? <laughs> and obviously what they were saying was, I've had the thrill of being fully attended to for an hour or two. Now that tells us something really important about what it means to belong to a social species. It means that being accepted, being noticed, being understood, 
being heard is one of our most fundamental social needs. And in fact, if you, if you said to me, OK, Hugh, I'm convinced about the kindness revolution. I want to sign up. You know, where do I join? What do I do first? I'd say uh, the first thing to do if you're a true kindness revolutionary, if you're committed to radical kindness, the first thing to do is sharpen up your listening skills. I, I don't say this to you as advice because you're one of the great listeners, <laughs> but, but in general, we need, to, we need to focus on the skill of, of uh, attentive, empathic listening, um, knowing that, in fact, we're not qualified to respond to what someone is saying to us until we've heard them out, until we've fully absorbed what they're saying, then and only then are we entitled to make some response to it. But even more importantly than that, when we devote ourselves to the listening act, without needing to say a word, we are conveying to that person that we take them seriously enough to bother listening to them. And that is perhaps the most potent expression of our capacity for kindness. That is a really kind act, which has, like most acts of kindness, a therapeutic effect on the person who receives that act of kindness, sometimes even a transformative effect. People saying, for the first time, I feel as though someone really is taking me seriously, is really interested in what I think. But just notice, uh, there's a gloomy footnote to this. The converse is also true. If I don't listen, if I pretend to listen, if I'm staring at my watch all the time or looking over your shoulder, hoping to catch sight of someone more interesting to talk to, what's the message I'm conveying? Again, without needing to say a word, I'm saying, I'm sorry. In fact, probably not even I'm sorry. I'm just saying, I don't take you seriously enough to bother listening to you. Now, would, would we ever say that to a partner, to a child, to a neighbour, to a colleague? We'd never say that. And yet when we fall short of committed empathic listening, it's so unkind to pretend to be listening or just not to listen that that's the unspoken message. I'm not, I'm not taking you seriously enough to extend the act of kind listening. I think the act of listening is a challenging one for all of us at, at any time. And you describe something called the mind cage in, in your book, which I'd love you to outline. But I, as you're speaking, I'm aware of how much more difficult it is in our current environment to give someone that undivided attention when most of us have a device nearby or have got attention running elsewhere. I think it's really counter to the culture mm -hmm. in a deep way to focus on someone mm -hmm in the sort of way that you're describing here. It's very true, Sarah. Um, we, we're becoming a culture of transmitters rather than receivers. Uh, you know, even in school, kids are being encouraged to stand up and express their opinions and learn to speak in public and so on. Not much talk about listening, not much acknowledgement of the fact that the magic ingredient in human communication is listening. But yes, uh, lots of distractions from listening but the point you make is absolutely valid. It is a tough assignment. Um, kindness comes naturally to us, but listening is one of the hardest manifestations of kindness. It's one of the, as I've said, it's one of the most potent expressions of kindness, but it's one of the hardest to do because, uh, well, I'll, I'll refer briefly to the, the mind cage, the metaphor that you mentioned that I deal with at some length in the book. Um, where what I'm really saying is from a very early age, in fact, from the age of three onwards, really, when we start laying down recallable memory traces in the brain, uh, we are engaged in a lifelong process of constructing a framework of knowledge, attitudes, beliefs, prejudices, expectations, uh, all based on a combination of our lived experience and what we read and what our teachers tell us and very particularly what example our parents have shown us and so on. And all of these learnings, all of these, the, these, these uh, attitudes, values, beliefs, etc., cetera, uh, create a kind of framework 
um, which allows us, it's like a template that we lay over the world in order to make sense of what's going We interpret what's happening in the light of what we think we know and believe and so on. So you can think of that template as being like an invisible psychological cage uh, that we construct around ourselves. Think, think of me and Sarah and all of us as being within this mind cage. Think of it as a cage around your head, perhaps, um, uh, which, of course, feels wonderful. We feel safe. We feel secure. We feel comfortable within our cage because we've built it. You know, it's, it's a life's work. And... Of course, I'm, I know about psychology and of course, you know about broadcasting and, you know, we're experts in our field. You know, don't try and tell us something about that. Um, the problem, of course, is that once the mind cage has become reasonably sophisticated and by mi our middle years, it's pretty complex and pretty sophisticated, we are no longer seeing or hearing what's out there. We're seeing it all filtered through the pattern imposed on our view of the world by the mind cage. So the listening challenge is to step outside the comfort and security of your own mind cage and try to enter into the cage of the other, to try and imagine what it must be like. I'll, I'll give you a gross example. What must it be like to be Donald Trump? Uh, so that's what we're trying to do when we listen. We're trying to imagine what could have produced a person like that to say the sort of things he said, um, not just retreat to the comfort and security of our own mind cage and say the man is an idiot, hopeless, uh, etc., cetera, um, uh, which is to say more than half of Americans must be idiots, hopeless, etc., because they voted for him uh, first time round and so on. That's another subject. We won't get on to that. I just use that as an, ex as an extreme case. But that's what we're doing when we listen. Now, my psychological hero, Carl Rogers, the American uh, pioneer, in psycho pioneer of the so-called client-centred school of psychotherapy, said that listening is one of the most courageous things we ever do. And this is really what he was talking about, that, that we have to have the courage to set our own prejudices aside for a moment, set, set aside all the stuff we think we know and just enter in, just entertain what we're hearing. And the reason he says we need courage for that is that if we're truly entertaining what another person is saying, we are running the risk of being changed by what we hear. Mm. And none of us look forward to being changed I think that courage, it's, it's starkest or easy to see, clearer to see, often when we're having conversations with people we regard as not our lessers, but as we're more powerful than when we're talking to children or when we're talking to employees, that, that deep listening, which, as you say, by definition, opens oneself to, to change, is something that when we're in a position of relative power, we're very resistant mm. to doing. Oh, yes, that's right. We know our mind cage is superior, uh, so we're very happy to stay within it. But, of course, the cage starts at an early age. You know, we are building it. Um, I tell the story in the book, which was a story told to me by a primary school teacher who said he took a class on a bush ramble and asked them just to observe what they were seeing. And when they got back uh, to their classroom to write down all the things that they'd observed on the ramble, you know, in, in nature... And, and when he collected the papers, he found one of the boys in the class had written, no kangaroos. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all he'd written. Uh, and the teacher said, oh, well, I understand you didn't see any kangaroos, but what did you see? And, and the boy said very honestly, I was only looking for kangaroos. <laughs> well, that's the problem. You know, when we have a position, you know, if, you, if you're a dentist, you're only looking for teeth. Uh, it's, a, it's a problem... Um, that because the more expert we become, the more experienced we become, the more potentially blinkered we become, the more the mind cage feels right and feels as though we have to reinforce it and protect it. Uh, and so some humility is called for, even when communicating with a child, some humility is called for to say, I've got to step outside this for a moment, I've got to get out into the, into the cold and see what it might be like to be that child. Who taught you to be a good listener, Hugh? 
Um, by example, I think my mother. Um, my mother was, she was such a good listener. <laughs> um, uh, she was a seriously undereducated woman uh, and had no, she, she wasn't a neighborhood gossip or anything. She didn't even seem to be particularly interested in other people's lives, but she had this receptive look on her face. And she would come home from a shopping excursion exhausted from having had someone's life story, usually a tale of woe, or she'd sit next to someone on the bus coming home from the city and out would pour the story, and she would listen to all this. So I think I did learn from her, and she listened to her sons, my brother and me. Um, the one person in her life that she didn't listen to was my father. Um, and uh, I once heard a visitor to our home uh, saying to my mother, because my father talked a lot, I mean, talked all the time. Uh, and this visitor said to my mother very sympathetically, how do you put up with it? How do you stand all the talking? And my mother said, oh, I gave up listening years ago. <laughs> were you a talkative child or were you a more no, observant, no, no, was, quiet child? I was a reclusive, introverted reader. Yes, in fact... Uh, uh, well, well, yes, this is not a talk, not a discussion about my history, but I do, I do confess in the book that my mother once took me on a holiday. I don't know why I was privileged to go on a holiday with my mother. Maybe she was trying to encourage me to talk, but she told me later that for two days of that holiday I hadn't said a word. <laughs> and so I believe her. Were I, you happy in your silence, do you think? Oh, yeah. 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 A rich inner yeah. silence. Yeah, I, yeah, I think I had a lovely childhood, really. Mm. We spoke about cynicism together this morning and, and I guess this might sound like a cynical question. I hope it doesn't. But some of the hallmarks of the kind of kindness revolution that you describe, you know, uh, uh, more concern for our neighbours, a concern for people who are experiencing homelessness or a disability, a wider concern for refugees or people in other countries, a better equality in, in economy in Australia, all of this sort of vision that you have for Australia. As I was reading about it, I was thinking, you know, that sounds quite a lot like the platform that Labor brought to the election in 2019, and we know what happened there. So is there an appetite for the kind of Australia that you're describing, or are we showing ourselves in reality not to really want that? Well, can we just take a step back again and remind ourselves about the quarter century that we'd been through? Uh, that quarter century did not prepare the electorate for Labor's policy platform uh, in, in 2019. Um, not at all. It might be a different story now. It would depend how it was framed. I mean, there are a lot of stories that could be presented now framed in the context of our very recent and current experience of COVID uh, that I think would have much more take up than they would at a time of great national complacency and rampant individualism. The, the mood was completely wrong uh, for Labor's pitch at that election. And there are other problems. Their, their leader was unattractive, the electorate and so on. Um, but, but yes, I mean, Kindness is all about other people. Kindness is not something we do for ourselves. Kindness is a response to an understanding of what it means to be human, which is we'd better care for the planet that sustains us and we'd better care for the species. We'd better, uh, we'd better attend to the needs of other people. The cynical, highly individualistic response says the opposite, says we'd better look out for number one. And, uh, and in fact, the whole story is a bit grim and it's all going to end badly. And, I, you know, I told you so when something goes wrong. Uh, cynicism is the polar opposite of kindness. It's, you... it's destructive rather than constructive. And it's bleak and pessimistic, whereas kindness is an essentially optimistic quality in humans. We are, we are committed to kindness because we're engaged in the project of making the world a better place. That's what it's about. When you, when you just pass someone in the street on your way here and you smiled at them, that might have been the moment when that person was feeling bleak, 
underappreciated, ignored, and this lovely woman passed them in the street and smiled at them. Goodness knows who she was. Uh, we didn't speak, but just at that moment I was illuminated by a feeling that someone noticed me. So a smile can make the world a better place, mm. and so can much larger acts of kindness. But that's what, that's that's the project that we are committed to if we join the revolution, or and we don't even have to jo join the revolution. We just have to be true to our nature. But cynicism is essentially unkind and essentially bleak. You know, the cynic says, a problem shared is a problem doubled. Very cynical. So you think it is reasonable and not too idealistic to expect kindness from our politicians? Is that something that we should be demanding? Because it seems a long way away uh, from, from what we've experienced. Yeah, I doubt if I'll live to see it. Um, but I, I must, I must, well, I have two responses to that, Sarah. One is, of course, there's something wrong with the structure of our parliamentary democracy. Let's not pretend that this is the most brilliant model for democracy that we could imagine. I'm sure everybody in this auditorium could spend the next 10 minutes writing down a few things that they'd like to change to improve the quality. I mean, we've, we've inherited from the so-called mother parliament an, an, an essentially structurally adversarial um, a, a parliament, which is geared up for not just for contesting ideas, which would be healthy, but for a knockdown, drag out competition in which there will be winners and losers. If you win an election, you own the game. What a terrible situation. That's not democratic. Uh, that's some other kind of system. So, so the system is against kindness. The system is in favour of huge competitiveness, ruthlessness, uh, dogmatism, etc. Uh, so that's a problem. Um, the other, the, the counter, of course, to that is, if we are actually going to revolutionise politics, we will first have to revolutionise the culture. Politics will change when enough of us are saying that that society that we dream of, the one that's kinder, more compassionate, more inclusive, more tolerant, uh, more harmonious, etc., when we start living as if it is that kind of society, if enough of us do that, and I'm really hopeful that COVID might have been enough of a shock to encourage us to go on acting the way we do in a crisis, beyond the crisis, if enough of us do that, gradually, marriage by marriage, family by family, street by street, neighbourhood by neighbourhood, town by town, workplace by workplace, the ripples go out, kindness multiplies. Uh, we could change the culture and the rising tide of kindness would reach the ballot box <laughs> eventually. And we would start to say to our political candidates, you want to represent us, we want to know where you stand on kindness. We want to know whether you're prepared to incorporate kindness as one of the key, perhaps kindness and fairness, as the key criteria for first judging uh, a, a social policy or an economic policy. Is it kind? Is it fair? Um, and if you're not, well, we'll look elsewhere for a candidate, regardless of what party you represent. I, I think that's a conceivable process in the revolution, but it won't happen this year. Um, but neither did the gender revolution, which is still going. I mean, it, the second wave came here in the 70s. It had, it had a transformative effect, probably the biggest single um, social upheaval of the 20th century. Uh, and here we are in 2021, and we know it still has a significant way to run. And I've got some, uh, I hope, constructive things to say about that in the book. But at least... Revolutions that are going to change the culture are not going to be quick, but they do require a core of very determined people like everyone here to say, well, we're going to be committed. We're going to, we're going to accept that that's our default position and we're going to incorporate some daily disciplines that will remind us of what it means to be fully human and we're going to live like that 
Whether we get a good response or not, by the way, that's another thing about kindness. We're not in it for the reward. Mm. We're not in it in the expectation that because we're going to be kinder, so is everyone else to us. They may not be. We are going to open it to questions from you in just a moment. So have a think about what you said and if there are particular points you'd like to ask him or bring up to bring up with him. There'll be that opportunity in, in just a moment. And maybe we could push to have you sort of forget wise elder. We could just appoint you monarch. I mean, I'd be happy that we could just <laughs> bypass that. Um, I wanted to ask you, well, let's think. You just mentioned that there are daily practices that can incorporate or, or keep us more sensitive to kindness in our own lives. What, mm. what are they? Give me some as a suggestion. Um, my favourite is the death perspective. Uh, sorry to mention. <laughs> I, I hope I everyone's had a drink already on Friday. Uh, <laughs> I don't think of this as a gloomy topic at all, by the way. I mean, we're all going to die. It's an experience we're all going to go through. Um, it will be a moment of, in fact, the, the second last chapter of the book um, refers to the fact that life is inherently perfect and only resolves in death. I mean, that's something to look forward to, that there is a moment of perfection when you are perfectly dead. Uh, until then, it's all, it's all imperfect. Um, so one of, one of the things we know about the approach of death is that, in fact, it's a guarantee we can, we can, we can offer people. It is, it is definitely the case that when your death is approaching, you are not going to say, I wish I'd made more money. <laughs> you are not going to say, I wish I'd been busier. You are not going to say, I wish I had more runs on the board. But you are probably going to say, judging by the account of all the people who've written in their die, the dying stages of their life, and people who've observed other people in the dying stages of their life, you're probably going to say, is there someone I should apologize to? Is there someone I should forgive? And fundamentally, have I been kind enough? Uh, uh, have I been a sufficiently loving partner? Have I been uh, a supportive, uh, reliable parent? Have I been a loyal friend? Have I been a kind neighbor? Uh, etc. Et uh, those are the questions that rise uh, uh, in our minds when we know there's not much time left and we're looking back. So I suggest as a, as a serious discipline that we take the death perspective as a daily, daily practice. Simply say as, as part of our reflection at the end of the day, was I kind enough? Uh, did I listen attentively when someone needed me to? Or did I rush in with my own opinion? Uh, did I forgive someone who wronged me? Did I apologize to someone that I'd wronged or offended? Uh, it's, a, it's a, I think, a really useful exercise to say, later in my life, when I'm 99, these are the questions I'm going to be asking myself. So it would be really disappointing at the end to say, ah, oh, Actually, you know, I fell so far short of the kind of life I would like to have lived. I'm afraid that I'm not going to be remembered kindly or fondly by this and this and this person. Well, why not start when you're 32 uh, every night um, reflecting on those questions? And not, not, not to be harsh on yourself, but just to be reflective, uh, to see whether there are ways that tomorrow we might do it a little better than we did it today. I think it would be great if we could all just take Hugh home to our own <laughs> homes, put him in our computer, have him in Parliament. But unfortunately, we can't do that. But we can all thank Hugh McKay very much for this evening. Thanks.